Hi, today I'm going to be presenting on the complexities of ethnomusicological fieldwork in South Asian music. So I'm going to structure my presentation around four major problems. The first problem is that of discipleship, becoming a part of a musical culture that does not that is not very kind to outsiders. The second is the problem of perspective. How do you reconcile um, conflicting ideas about music and, um, and the other social issues related to music? The third is that of conflicting loyalties. How do you um, reconcile your loyalty to your academic discipline and your loyalty to, the, to your teacher? And the last is the responsibility to tradition. So a lot of this um, a, lot of the, a lot of the content for this presentation is going to come from James Kippen's uh, essay titled Working with the Masters, which was published in the book Shadows in the Field, which is basically a collection of essays on, um, on ethnomusicological fieldwork. So it's important to talk about the Guru Shishya tradition before we actually delve into the, into the ideas that are discussed in this presentation. Um, the Guru Shishya tradition is the primary mode of instruction within Hindustani music. So a guru or an ustad takes on a disciple and then requires complete obedience and devotion from the shagird or the shishya. And then the disciple would learn the craft of music making over a long period of time, both, by directly, uh, both directly through lessons and also through interacting with the musical culture. Um, therefore, uh, disciples learned not only the art of music making, but also the art of becoming a musician in a, in a complete sense of the word. On the other hand, ethnomusicologists um, conduct fieldwork by embedding themselves in musical cultures. So they would spend time at fieldwork sites where they observe and learn and interact with musicians and experience the musical culture that is present in the area. And then they would collect data through interviews, recordings and conversations and mainly through observation and active participation within the musical culture. So all of this observation and participation would produce either an etic analysis or an emic analysis. So an ethic analysis is when an ethnomusicologist would analyze the culture in a more comparative cross-cultural way and would scrutinize the information that they receive from <clears throat> their informants. On the other hand, in an emic analysis, they uh, would view the culture solely within the cultural context of that particular culture and they would accept whatever is told to them by the informants as complete truths. So, the first problem that an ethnomusicologist has to face is that of becoming a shagird in the first place. So the, the process of becoming a disciple is, is a very arduous process. And it was especially so back in the 70s and the 80s where James Kippens um, did do his most of his field work. Uh, but now uh, with, the, uh, with the rise of technology, with the stars becoming more modernized, this kind of thing is changing. But it's the, the principle still remains the same. So this process of becoming a shagat is even harder for researchers since they're more often than not from the West and they're viewed as um, outsiders. So uh, in this essay, James Kippen relates the story of how he went to Lucknow to look for Ustad Afa Hussain, a tabla player of the Lucknow Karana. When he got there, he was met with suspicion and mistrust because there was already this um, stigma against, against research and against interacting with researchers. So it, it took him a long amount of time to establish trust where he would just, where he would be asked questions repeatedly about his own research and, and his own intentions behind his, behind his research. But after uh, a disciple is accepted and initiated, then they're welcome into the complex and this colorful world that, they're, that the Ustad resides in. So on the other hand, the Ustads also have a very um, high expectation. So they expect diligence and loyalty while the shagids are learning. And the relationship itself is a very deeply personal relationship between the two parties where an ustad provides individualized attention to, to their shagird and the shagird does the same. But however, it's also important to note that this relationship is very asymmetric. So a shagird has to be like, a, like an innocent child who does not question any of uh, his ustad's ideas, where the ustad is viewed as this omniscient being who who cannot be questioned. And then there's also the cultural expectation of khidmat and obedience, where a disciple has to serve their master and and sort of take care of their personal and uh, their personal needs. So this leads us to the problem of perspective. So first, let's talk about 
the power structures that exist within the Guru Shishya tradition. So we looked at how um, the Guru Shishya tradition was a fairly asymmetric relationship. So for our researchers, they have to transition from being just a disciple to a disciple researcher to, in order to access more knowledge. What this means is that they have to um, that they have to negotiate their boundaries again and again and sort of test the waters and see what sort of knowledge they can access, which is a very difficult and very um, time-taking process. Furthermore, um, it is still incredibly unacceptable to enter into a debate or a dialectic about the historical and the social issues that surround music. Um, and since these things are quite, like for example, discussions on Tungri and Tungri's social status is, is quite a taboo, discussing that is quite a taboo in Khayal gharanas or even in instrumental gharanas. And therefore there is this weird paradoxical nature that exists between the knowledge of teachers and researchers. Teachers exist within their own narrowly defined universe where they reign supreme, where whatever they say is accepted as truth. But then researchers have access to this, this universe that is that is larger than that of the um, Ustad. But then there's also this idea that, so that forms this very complex dialogic relationship where a researcher would have more understanding about the world that the Ustad lives in but then would also not have the repertoire or the, or the knowledge or the means to understand um, what the significance of the world that the Ustad is living in. So another problem that uh, this asymmetric relationship um, causes is that historical accuracy becomes a problem. So for, for scholars that work in history, it is next to impossible to challenge an Ustad's knowledge of history. and what happens is anecdotal history can often contain factual inaccuracies. So a researcher can't really access um, information about an ustad's social status or background or past. So having a candid conversation about these things is often considered incredibly imprudent. And therefore, as seen here, a more experienced researcher would have to infer these things from conversations rather than explicitly talk about them. On the other hand, there are also a lot of lectures an entire world of non-academic discourse. People write books all the time about um, non-academic texts about music and their relationships to music all the time. So these books are usually written by connoisseurs or enthusiasts or disciples. And more often than not, they're hagiographies of influential musicians. And they often contain factual inaccuracies because they usually present anecdotes and, um, and, and, and ideas that are just, they've heard from other people that, that are reported in books. But um, they do also provide an insight into the cultural landscape of the music and the nature of connoisseurship and music appreciation. So on the right, you see The Lost Word of Hindustani Music, um, a book by Kumar Prasad Mukherjee, which is a very popular non-academic text talking about musicians of the early and mid 20th century. So the third problem that we look at is that of conflicting loyalties. So, there is a very natural inherent um, conflict of interest between musicians and researchers. So musicians um, have the power to restrict whatever knowledge is published. They, uh, they're, they're afraid of whatever the, the knowledge that they publish of being stolen by people from other gharanas. And that is an understandable in the cultural context because they, there is a, this sense of protectiveness that has been ingrained into them over the past 150 to 200 years. Also, there's this inherent tension between how an analyst wants to describe something versus how the performer wants to describe something. So like, unfortunately, there's often a difference between what masters say and what they do or how things really are. So reporting the truth often carries a certain cost. So Kippen wrote about his Ustad's family even though uh, his Ustad would not have approved of it. And this is often the case where researchers write about their uh, Ustad's and their families taking advantage of the fact that their Ustad's cannot access the academic texts that are written by them. So, But also on the other side there um, are a lot of social issues that risk censored by musicians because a lot of these topics that uh, ethnomusicologists want to talk about are considered taboo within um, the musician communities. Therefore, 
uh, especially for inexperienced researchers, they find it very difficult to talk about these complex issues because it's hard to navigate uh, the boundaries of what is deemed acceptable to talk about within um, the nature of within within these gharanas. However, it's also important to understand that exposing the truth can be harmful to musicians because they do live in a society where social stigma uh, carries a lot of weight. So researchers should um, sh must take great care in understanding the impact of what they're publishing. So there also have been cases in the past where Ustads have used the loyalty of a disciple to elicit their loyalty as scholars. And they've pressurized them into justifying contemporary lore and presenting it as historical fact. However, um, so the reason they do that is because they want to historicize their claims of um, prestigious lineages, which is a very important aspect of social um, reputation and prestige within the world of Hindustani classical music. So James Kippen writes about this um, anecdote concerning Birju Maharaj's ancestors and the ancestors of Ustad Afaf Hussain and how, um, how uh, Birju Maharaj's ancestors were, uh, were, were supposedly Brahmin, which sort of adds this legitimacy to the art form of Qatar. However, there isn't much historical truth to that statement and um, it simply serves to show how not reporting the truth or, uh, or reporting fabricated accounts can often lead to a very real world impact on, on the lives of these musicians. So lastly, we'll come to a concluding section where we talk about the responsibility to tradition. So what happens is that in this entire research or dis disciple dichotomy, um, there is this academic responsibility that a, um, that a researcher has to paint a portrait of a musical tradition as accurately as possible, even though this et accurate ethnographic writing can be very uncomfortable. On the same, um, on the same spectrum, these ethnomusicologists also faces responsibility towards tradition. Since they spend so much time within these musical cultures, they sort of become embedded into them. And in some cases, they can also become an active link in the chain. So James Kippen became an active um, proponent of the Lucknow Gharana Tabla tradition, where he also became a teacher and, and um, he also served as one of the le leading members of the Gharana. And then they also become representatives of the, of the tradition and then they help transmit knowledge. So just to conclude, there are several challenges that ethnomusicologists faced when they uh, perform fieldwork. And their work often, um, often entails obtaining access and then disseminating very privileged information that would not be available publicly otherwise. So they, then they have this entire, um, so then they have this academic responsibility to their discipline and they also have a responsibility to tradition and to their ustads and their gurus etc. So there's this entire problem of conflicting loyalties and then figuring out how to effectively reconcile them while also not causing harm to the truth or, and not causing harm to the musicians and their, uh, and their world as well. So some of these references uh, that I used were the Life of Music in North India, a text by Daniel Newman about the social organizations of music in India, of musicians in India. Then um, Shadows in the Field, which was basically a collection of essays about fieldwork. Then James Kippen's um, dissertation on the Tabla of the Lucknow Karana, And a short introduction on ethnomusicology by Timothy Rice. Thank you.